National Guard Retention and Co College Access Act, H.R. 4489, the FEHBP Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan Prescription Drug Integrity Transparency and Cost Savings Act, and H.R. 4865, the Federal Employees and Uniformed Services Retirement Equity Act of 2010. Consideration of H.R. 1722, uh, will be the first order of business. This is the Telework Improvement Act of 2009. Without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will each have five minutes to make opening statements. Hearing no objections, I'm pleased to bring forth the latest version of the federal government's telework improvement measure. In short, H.R. 1722 seeks to improve and expand access to telework among federal employees government-wide. The bipartisan measure before us today was introduced by our colleague, Representative John Sarbanes, along with myself and Congressman Frank Wolf, Jerry Conley, Jim Moran, Dutch Ruppersberger, and Danny Davis. Despite the evolving nature in the way the federal government conducts its affairs, telework continues to be un underutilized by federal agencies, and this bill provides for improvements that will hopefully increase the number of federal employees that participate in telework programs. Some of the most notable aspects of H.R. 1722 include requiring agencies to develop, de to develop detailed telework plans within one year of the bill's enactment that ensure authorized employees are permitted to telework to the maximum extent possible. It also encourages OPM and GSA to work collaboratively to develop regulations in a timely manner to overall, I'm sorry, oversee telework policies and telework. IT systems and security protocols. I'd like to also pause and thank both of these agencies for the help that they have lent this subcommittee in preparing H.R. 1722 for this morning's markup. H.R. 1722 also orders agencies to create a new employee position termed as the Telework Managing Officer, or TMO, which will help to ensure effective development and implementation of telework plans. The bill also stipulates an updated list of reporting requirements and timeliness for submitting information back to Congress and the Government Accountability Office on the issue of telework. The bill also seeks to elevate the importance of incorporating telework in agencies' continuity of operations planning, which I'm sure we all agree would have been quite helpful this past winter given the record snow totals that the National Capital Area received. In fact, we recently learned that because of telework, the federal government was able to save over $20 million, according to OPM. Thus, H.R. 1722 is both timely as well as critical if the federal government is going to evolve into a more efficient, prepared, and environmentally friendly entity. Language similar to what is included in H.R. 1722 was passed previously by the full oversight committee and the whole House under suspension during the 110th Congress, and I hope we can again repeat such action this year. At the appropriate time, I'll offer a manager's amendment, which will make further enhancements that strengthen the bill. However, before doing so, I will yield to my friend, the ranking member, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for any opening comments that he may have. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'd like to see us follow up on that. Uh, frankly, I've been frustrated in California that even with all our environmental regs and stuff like this, we are so slow to ch for government to respond. And I just say, let me just say that to my colleagues. So often we talk about individuals need to change their behavior. Uh, businesses have to change the way they operate. But government is always day late, dollar short, and the most, most um, um, uh, obstinate against trying to reform ourselves. And I think this is a way that we're sort of, again, leading, um, maybe not leading, we're following what a lot of the private sector is doing but at least we're taking the step, and I think we should be looking at more of this. So I would ask my colleagues to support this bill, but I also would ask us that we look seriously that this should be a consolidated um, commute reduction strategy that um, should be included in, in our environmental pr proposals, our contribution to the, to the fact of, of addressing the emissions problem by having the flex time and telecommuting as all as a coordinated effort, and I think somebody should be designated to coordinate the entire program. So I yield back and thank you very much for allowing me to participate. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I won't take up the five minutes. I just want to uh, express my uh, 
support for this legislation, um, which is uh, the lead sponsor is my colleague from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, I think it is very important that um, we have this kind of flexibility. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm looking forward to your amendment because I think it, it will bring even more clarity to this. I think we had a, I think one of the things that people are concerned about with, with regard to telework is whether uh, there might be abuses and um, I think that by giving OPM the necessary authority to structure the regulations uh, so that uh, that it works not only for in favor of the government but in favor of the employee, I mean, it has to be a two-way street. I think that uh, your amendment makes the bill even better. So uh, I wholeheartedly support it with so many uh, federal employees uh, living in my district in Baltimore. And, of course, in my district we have the uh, headquarters for Social Security. And so they are tremendously affected by this. And certainly going back to some of the things Ms. Norton was saying, uh, when it came time for when the storm, recent storms came about, uh, I put a lot of people in situations where uh, they probably could have accomplished a lot uh, from home. Uh, but the fact is, is that we, we have to make sure that we have the proper structure so that they can accomplish that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back in support of the bill. I thank the gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman uh, from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, who was also a driving force behind this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for your leadership and thank you for scheduling this markup today. Uh, telework is a, an increasingly important uh, part of the federal workforce. Uh, we, this committee, understands the challenge of recruiting and retaining employees for the future workforce. 600,000 federal workers are eligible for retirement over the next decade. Having more flexibility in the workplace is essential. As the recent blizzards here in the National Capital Region underscored, we had to shut down the federal government for four and a half days. And one of the reasons uh, that much of the federal government nonetheless continued to work and work well was because of telework, a very vital tool. I have the dubious distinction, Mr. Chairman, of representing a part of my district, the longest commute in America, number one, from Bristow, Prince William County, to Washington, D.C. Um, my commuters deal with this issue every day, and they know that this flexible tool can make a difference in the environment, in the quality of life, and in their productivity. So I'm delighted uh, to be an original co-sponsor of this legislation, and I very much look forward to working with you and my colleagues in this committee, Mr. Chairman, to make this become law. I thank the gentleman. If there are no further requests to speak, I will now call up H.R. 1722, the telework bill. The clerk will now read the bill. H.R. 1722, a bill to improve teleworking in executive agencies by developing a telework program that allows employees to telework at least 20 percent of the hours worked in every two administrative work weeks and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. At this time, I'd like to offer a manager's amendment to H.R. 1722. I believe the amendment is at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 1722 offered by Mr. Lynch. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I ask cons unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as original text. And I now recognize myself for five minutes. While the amendment I'm offering makes several modifications and technical changes, it doesn't alter the underlying purpose of the base bill. In fact, the amendment is designed to strengthen the several provisions of the uh, version introduced uh, by H.R. 1722. Uh, this modifies the definition of telework to capture expanded work arrangements currently used by federal employees. It grants OPM greater authority to set overall telework policy related regulations in, consultant, in consultation with GSA. Uh, re it requires agencies to include telework eligibility information on job descriptions and recruitment materials for open positions, and it sets specific time frames for the development of regulations and policy implementation. And by enhancing the role of the agency telework manage, managing officer as well as the bill's reporting requirements. I believe these changes address the concerns of many of my colleagues as well as various impacted agencies, and I hope all members will join me in supporting this amendment. 
I now yield to the ranking member for five minutes for any comments he may have on the amendment. No, I appreciate the work that's going into this, and I think you can see that we're all desirous of having uh, having a, a bill of this type uh, implemented. So I'll yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Does anybody, any any other member, wish to speak on this amendment? Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Chair recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Connolly, from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I support your amendment, and I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Connolly to the amendment offered by Mr. Lynch. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a relatively simple amendment. As I mentioned, the blizzard uh, of last month underscored um, how important having a continuity of operations plan in place is for uh, the private sector as well as the public sector. This amendment directs federal agencies to incorporate telework in their continuity of operations planning in coordination with the General Services Administration, uh, FEMA, and the Office of Personnel Management. It ensures that FEMA officials who already work on co-op uh, or COOP will work with other agencies to ensure that telework policies are implemented in a manner that's consistent with contingency plans for emergencies. By directing these agencies to develop implementation plans with training sessions, this amendment ensures that agencies will be prepared to use telework as a component of emergency management if federal operations are interrupted by a natural disaster or an attack in the future. We saw, Mr. Chairman, the efficacy of telework. Uh, you noted that uh, Mr. John Berry, the head of o uh, Office of Personnel Management, actually uh, adjusted downward the daily estimated cost and productivity for the shutdown because of telework. So instead of $102 million, uh, the cost of the uh, in productivity was re-estimated at $70 million, that $32 million difference being because telework programs were already in place. So I, I think this is consistent with your amendment and with the spirit of the bill, Mr. Chairman, and I urge the adoption of my amendment. I thank the gentleman for highlighting a uh, excuse me, do any other members wish to be heard on this amendment? The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. No, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate this amendment. I'm fully supportive of it. I, I appreciate it. It's in the spirit of what we're all trying to do here. Uh, very supportive of this amendment. I appreciate the member for bringing it up. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Do any other members wish to be heard on this amendment? I thank the gentleman for highlighting a critical issue, the area that uh, relates to the telework uh, bill the importance of agencies being able to operate effectively and efficiently during emergencies or other disruptions. Although you call that a, a blizzard down here in, 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 in Boston, we would call that flurries <laughs> or, or a dusting. Uh, but uh, the amendment is a reasonable amendment, nevertheless, and I am prepared to support it. If no other member wishes to speak on the amendment, the question is on adopting the Conley Amendment to the Lynch Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. If there are no further amendments. Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. I have an additional amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 1722, offered by Mr. Connolly. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that the committee staff would like me to withdraw this amendment and work with you and others on the committee uh, to see if we can't make this a reality. The intent of my amendment is to provide grants to provide more empirical data and analysis of the efficacy of telework so that as we are moving forward, we have that database uh, behind us. Sometimes we operate on the anecdotal. I'd like to move beyond the anecdotal. In respect to you, Mr. Chairman, and your leadership on this issue, um, I'm prepared to withdraw the amendment uh, on the understanding that we'll work together before we get to the floor uh, to see if we can't address this issue. Would the gentleman yield? Um, the gentleman uh, has concluded his remarks. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Billibray. Yes. Um, I would just ask the um, chairman and the gentleman from Virginia that before we start um, allocating grants and spending money on 
new studies um, that we solicit um, the studies that have already been done. And I don't mean to keep coming back to this, but I can't ignore you know, the 16 years of working on air stuff in California, which you know, we've been over this. There's been a lot of this type, kind of studies gone on, and I would just ask that we draw on those experiences. You guys have been great. Virginia adapts all, almost all our air regs uh, verbatim down the line because we have sort of been over the road and why, why reinvent it? And I would just ask that we take a look at what is available before we start talking yeah. about um, have, doing a whole new research and covering the same ground. Mr. Chairman? Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, the comments of my friend from California, and I concur with them. Um, I, I do believe, however, uh, we have to constantly refresh data, uh, but I wouldn't in any, uh, in any way want to even suggest that we not take a look at the uh, many, many studies that have been done and compiled that clearly demonstrate the uh, effectiveness and productivity gains, morale gains, and so forth uh, due to uh, telework. So I, I would agree with the gentleman, which is why I am prepared to withdraw the amendment and work with the chairman and my colleagues, including the gentleman from California, as we move forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from the District of Columbia, gentleman oh. lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Yep. Eleanor Holmes no Norton, for five minutes. Well, I, I, I agree with what uh, both of my friends uh, have said about this this matter. I do want to indicate that that uh, the federal government has a very long record with teleworking, and I should think that the federal government ought to have a built-in capacity of its own. And I also would like uh, to, to refer the committee when you are studying how to move forward on Mr. Connolly's committee to the many GAO studies that have been done of teleworking within the federal government. I and mean, we can keep doing studies and studies, and in many ways the, the private sector is way ahead of us because they got a big incentive uh, to save funds. Uh, but I, I also believe that while it, 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 it would be good to have a, a uh, and I'm not sure whether Mr. Connolly means a, a um, private uh, university center or center within the federal government, uh, just as the federal government has to keep record of its own efficiency in so many ways, one of the great problems we have is we do not even know uh, who does teleworking, who should, it, should, who should do it, and I should think that that capacity ought to be built into the federal government, whether through, whether through agencies or through, through OPM. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, just briefly, I, I agree completely with the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, and she's put her finger on something very important. There's lots of unexamined data, even, that I think would shore up our case, both within the federal government and, as she so uh, aptly points out, in the private sector, which actually is ahead of us in the public sector in implementing robust telework programs. So I'm just trying to get at that so we have a robust database, but I will, I promise, uh, uh, after I withdraw this amendment, uh, at, at the suggestion of the chairman, work with him and my colleagues uh, to make that happen. I thank the gentleman. I, I do know, and, and I appreciate that the gentleman's efforts in this uh, policy area overall, and I thank him for offering what is really a novel and innovative amendment. I do know that our staffs have been uh, working on this. They're in discussions uh, with your staff on possible refinements uh, to your suggested amendment. And I appreciate the gentleman's uh, comments uh, from, from California as well, because I think there is some, there's plenty of data out there, although we could certainly uh, benefit from uh, more accurate and precise uh, data, as, as uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia has pointed out. Uh, but we will work with you uh, between now and consideration of, of the bill at the full committee level. And uh, I appreciate the courtesy uh, that the gentleman has uh, displayed in withdrawing his amendment. And uh, I'm not sure if anybody else has uh, any comments on this. Just for the record, Mr. Chairman, th I thank you. And I do hereby withdraw the amendment. Are there any other amendments on this particular bill? Hearing none, and recognizing that the gentleman's second amendment has been withdrawn, uh, I now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia report H.R. 1722 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. 
The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 1722 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor will now signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 1722 is, as amended, is ordered reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. We will now consider H.R. 3913, the Major David F. Worley, Jr., District of Columbia National Guard Retention and Colleges Access Act. The bill was named in remembrance of General Worley, former commanding general of the District of Columbia National Guard, who died tragically in the June 22, 2009 Metro Rail crash. I'd like to personally thank Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton for her tireless work and leadership in introducing this bill. Uh, H.R. 3913 was introduced on October 22, 2009, and directs the mayor of the District of Columbia to establish a District of Columbia National Guard Educational Assistance Program to encourage the enlistment and retention of persons in the District of Columbia National Guard by providing financial assistance to enable members of the National Guard of D.C. to attend undergraduate, vocational, or technical school. The bill before us this morning honors the men and women who are protecting our nation's capital by authorizing funding for the District of Columbia National Guard Retention and College Assistant Program to provide members with an opportunity to receive a higher education. The Appropriations Committee has previously allocated funds for the D.C. Guard to pay the costs of the Retention and College Assistance Program, but it has never been authorized. Further, because the states surrounding the district already provide educational assistance, we risk losing the District of Columbia Guards, thereby making this bill vital for the retention and recruitment of these men and women. When appropriate, we will offer a simple amendment to this bill but at the moment, I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, for any comments he might have on this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank the gentleman for bringing up this, uh, this bill. We're very supportive of this, and of course, the men and women who serve uh, and to protect this country and, and Washington, D.C. in such an able way. This bill is intended to equalize incentives offered by the National Guard units in neighboring jurisdictions, which have sim similar educational incentives enacted by their state governors. We're very supportive of this bill and look forward to it being enacted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the chief sponsor of this uh, and driving force behind this and a very capable uh, representative of the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you bringing this bill forward so we can authorize this bill this year. And I associate myself with your remarks and the remarks of the, of the ranking member. Um, the president is the official who call, calls out the D.C. National Guard. Uh, so this is properly a matter for the federal government. The, the surrounding states uh, compete uh, for membership in the National Guard. And as we are aware, uh, uh, with the wars that began uh, uh, in, in recent years, there has been uh, some difficulty in recruiting to the guards. The guards serve uh, uh, abroad, and we know of their extraordinary service uh, in the present wars and in other wars, none more so than in uh, the present war. Uh, but we know them best for what they do at home because that is their major work. And Maryland, uh, Maryland and Virginia have wisely uh, added uh, assistance, tuition assistance, in order to help attract and, for that matter, uh, to uh, 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 commend their, their guards for the work they do at home and abroad. Uh, I have been able to get funds by uh, working through appropriators, but I am a member of this uh, committee, Mr. S Mr. Chairman, and I believe every bill should be properly authorized. Indeed, OPM has raised the question of whether or not this shouldn't should proceed because it had not been authorized. I appreciate that the authorized amount uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, has been raised from 5,500 as it was some years ago to 6,000 in keeping with the costs of uh, tuition uh, this year. And I think it recognizes the fact that the Congress has enacted its own GI Bill and wants to give as much uh, aid uh, to those who are parts of our volunteer army uh, as we can to help them cover the rising costs of, 
of tuition and going uh, to, to college. Um, the bill also of, uh, provides for greater cooperation between the commanding general who pays the most attention to uh, these grants and uh, the mayor of the District of Columbia who is very pleased to have these grants and offers some funds of the city's funds in, in addition. Uh, this year, I, uh, when, when this bill is passed, the appropriators will now have before it a, an authorized bill and one that I particularly thank you, Mr. Chairman, will bear the name of General David F. Worley, Jr., who with his wife was among those who died in the tragic Metro crash in, in June, uh, as you indicated. Thank you very much again, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Does any other member wish to be heard on this? Hearing none, I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. I believe I have a manager's amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3913, offered by Mr. Lynch. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as original text, and I now recognize myself for five minutes. The amendment uh, that I am offering to H.R. 3913 is, is fairly straightforward in that it only increases the amount of financial assistance provided to members serving in the D.C. National Guard from $5,500 to $6,000 per year, an amount that is consistent with what the Guards currently receive. As stated in the introduced version of the bill, these funds will be used to cover tuition and fees, costs of books, and laboratory expenses. Further, the amendment will also help to enhance the continuity of the existing program and preserve its operating structure by adding language to ensure ongoing coordination between the mayor and the commanding general of the District of Columbia National Guard. Again, I thank the lead sponsor of this bill, Congresswoman Norton, for introducing this bill and for reviewing the proposed amendment. I hope all members will join us in supporting this amendment, and I now yield to the ranking member for five minutes for any comments he may have. Do any other members wish to speak on this amendment? If no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the Lynch Amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All in the opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. I'll now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce Postal Service and the District of Columbia report H.R. 3913 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is now on favorably reporting H.R. 3913 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to in H.R. 3913 as amended, is ordered, reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. We now move to consider H.R. 4489, the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program Prescription Drug Integrity, Transparency, and Cost Savings Act. This legislation that my colleagues, Mr. Connolly and Mr. Currings, and I uh, introduced earlier this year is intended to significantly strengthen the federal oversight of the prescription drug benefits available to federal employees through the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program and to save that prog program millions of dollars. The bill provides the Office of Personnel Management greater oversight authority of the contracting and pricing methods used to purchase prescriptions in the FEHBP. This additional oversight will help better ensure that federal workers and annuitants are receiving the best benefits at the best price. Specifically, the bill would require pharmacy benefit managers that contract with health plans participating in the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan to return 99 percent of all the rebates and other payments from drug manufacturers for Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan business. Currently, nothing in the regulations or contracts require the pharmacy benefit manager to negotiate and return rebates to federal employees uh, in the health benefits program. The bill would also base health plan reimbursements to the pharmacy benefit managers on actual costs, not on inflated pricing ben benchmarks made up by the industry. Certain ownership relationships, including common 
corporate control of a pharmacy benefit manager and simultaneously a retail pharmacy would be prohibited. In addition, restrictions on brand name drug substitutions and new disclosure and transparency requirements are contained in this bill. After holding an oversight hearing on this subject last June, a policy forum in September, and a legislative hearing on H.R. 4489 last month, the one clear message that has resulted from these proceedings is that the contracting practices and pricing of prescription drugs in this federal program must change. I will be the first to admit that the Office of Personnel Management raised some concerns about the legislation. That is why we are recommending some changes to the bill in which I will discuss in detail a little bit later when I offer a manager's amendment. However, in closing, the PBM industry has gone largely unchecked since its inception in the 1980s. Their business model, which promotes secrecy, complex and convoluted contracts and is, is downright frustrating and made up prices, will not do well under this legislation. But federal employees and the American taxpayer will save millions and millions, if not billions, of dollars in prescription drug costs if this legislation is enacted. I urge my fellow members to support this bill, and I now yield to the ranking member for any comments he may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I need to uh, express that the uh, goals and, and uh, desires of where you want to take this are admirable and to which I concur. Uh, it attempts to save federal workers and the taxpayers' money by making changes to the pharmaceutical benefit. However, there are a number of reservations we have about this bill and how we go about achieving those goals. It uses the heavy-handed government regulation and invests far too much power in OPM. Additionally, I'm concerned about the anti-competitive nature and the unintended consequences that could be uh, uh, as a result of this legislation. The FEHBP prescription benefit allows federal workers to get expensive, cutting-edge drugs at a very good prices. Additionally, federal workers can choose mail order or retail pharmacies. If this bill is enacted, there will be negative effects, we believe, for the beneficiaries. We are concerned about the increase in cost and reduction of choice of pharmaceuticals because the current cost savings and, ef and e efficient relationships in place uh, that, that would be uh, uh, eviscerated by H.R. 4489. To have, a, to have thriving competitive markets, the players must be able to depend on confidentiality in certain areas. Companies that do believe should have the right to have certain trade secrets and pricing information. This is the American way and has allowed countless businesses to get a competitive edge and incentivizes them to do things that will benefit them uh, and consequently the public. This bill dictates how much profit an industry can make. Now, competition is good for the 8 million FEHBP enrollees and it, as it increases health care choices while reducing costs. But we must bear in mind that any changes to the program as, la as large as this will have consequences for the private sector as well. Price controls will be detrimental not only to FEHBP itself, but other markets that would be forced to bear the burden of this cost shifting. So, Mr. Chairman, we have, uh, I would urge you to reconsider a number of provisions in this bill and have some reservations about it. I yield back the balance of my time. Does any other member wish to be heard on this? The Chair recognizes the gentleman, lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, after holding um, a, a quite astonishing set of hearings, which I think opened the eyes of many members, not to mention many federal employees. I am grateful that you have brought this legislation for markup so quickly. Uh, the difference between how the OPM treats insurers on the one hand and those who provide a pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals to federal employees on the other simply cannot be justified. The whole point of the FEHBP is transparency, and I agree with the ranking member about competitiveness. Let us have all the information that, uh, that is necessary in order to know uh, which drug, drugs to buy. And that's the whole point of a market system, to get the information and transparency out there. What we have here is hands off uh, by the federal government in favor of a middleman called uh, PBMs, uh, uh, prescription, uh, I forget what it stands for, <laughs> their initials are what is stuck in my brain. Uh, these folks uh, do things like negotiate givebacks, for example, they pocket them, or at least we know who doesn't see them. Uh, if, in fact, they are getting discounts, why should those discounts not be 
um, not not be sh at least shared, indeed primarily shared, with those from whom uh, the funds come uh, in the first place. Mr. Chairman, what was perhaps most shocking to me uh, in your hearings was the information that what were called trade trade secrets was a, was open to other government agencies, but not to FEHBP. So other government agencies have this information, but somehow it becomes a trade secret uh, when it comes to this uh, workforce uh, that would that are covered by this bill. Uh, uh, I was very, very concerned, Mr. Chairman, to learn that not only are our federal employees paying more for prescription drugs than many federal programs like the VA, but we are paying more, we who are federal employees are paying more than private plans often are paying as well. We just passed a landmark health care bill, the likes of which this country has been trying to get for 100 years. Well, people may differ around this table, on the health, uh, around this bench, on the health care bill, but I don't see how we can justify uh, paying more, uh, allowing employees to pay more for pharmaceuticals because they don't have the information. And while you do not seek to regulate these people, you do seek to make them open and, and the information that is available uh, in, in other circumstances to other consumers also available to federal employees. And, and I, think, I think every federal employee will be most grateful when this bill is passed, as they, I believe, are uh, w now that we've passed the, 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 uh, the, the health care bill uh, just this week, this last week. And I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Does any other member wish to be heard? The chair recognizes the uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lynch, for uh, uh, this uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute. I think uh, your, the sense of this uh, amendment is very important. Uh, this is going to have a uh, favorable impact uh, on the prescription drug coverage of uh, federal employees. Uh, people who, who work for the federal government are uh, are entitled to this consideration, and uh, we should uh, uh, we should keep in mind uh, that uh, that this amendment, when it passes, is going to lower costs, and that's something that uh, uh, our our federal employees uh, should know that we care about for them. So thank you for putting it up. I thank the gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five I think minutes. I thank the chairman, and I'm, I'm pleased to be an original co-sponsor of this legislation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you indicated, we have an opportunity here uh, to shed some sunshine on a process that our own hearing showed was fairly murky. Uh, there wasn't a lot, you know, the PBMs, frankly, for the FEHB pro BP program operate too much in the dark, uh, both in process and in results. A little bit of sunshine would do a lot of good. In fact, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of good in terms of estimated projected savings for our federal workers in terms of the cost of prescription drugs. This isn't just an opinion. If you actually look at the average wholesale price under the FEHBP recipients compared to any other federal program, we rank in the bottom uh, by a very substantial margin. TRICARE, Veterans Affairs, Medicaid all get a better deal in the price of drugs than do federal employees. We're tied with Medicare Part D, which has an explicit prohibition against negotiated prices. That's how bad it is. So if PBMs were working, surely we'd do better than a program that has an explicit prohibition against the negotiation of pharmaceuticals. And yet it doesn't. And so that tells you something is wrong. My friend from, uh, from Utah talks about the con concern about protecting proprietary information, and, and I sympathize with that, but this bill actually protects proprietary information. The only disclosure requirement has to do with pricing. I don't think pricing is a proprietary piece of information when it comes to pharmaceut uh, pharmaceuticals for federal employees. So Mr. Chairman, this bill is an opportunity for those of us who are fiscal conservatives to save a lot of money for our federal employees in a federal program that's uh, very important to our workforce. 
uh, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor, and I thank you for your leadership. I thank the gentleman. I, I recognize myself just for five minutes. Uh, I think it's important to understand we have a, a system here of federal, uh, for the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan that covers about 8.5 million people. That's included wor current workers, retirees, and, and their families. When we looked at all of the federal uh, programs out there uh, and compared them, this, as Mr. Connolly noted, this was the worst. And I, I think one of the most stark examples that allows you to understand what we're dealing with here uh, was provided by a study uh, that was offered by uh, Jasmine Weaver of uh, Change to Win, who has been very helpful on this, and some, the, the advocates for federal employees. We compared two programs that are out there. Let, let me just illustrate this. There's a program that one of the major uh, drug stores has right now, so that if no one has, if someone has no insurance, no insurance, uh, they can participate in this. They can walk into a drug store, these these certain drug stores, and uh, they can participate in a plan, walk in and sign up, where they pay $9.99 for any drug on a 300 drug list, a formulary of 300 drugs. So they can walk in with no insurance and, and, uh, and sign up for that plan and pay $9.99 for their drugs. We have a health, federal employee health benefit plan pharmacy program that for federal employees, who have eight and a half million participants in their program, who pay 28 percent of the premium, who have the taxpayer picking up 72 percent of the premium, they walk into the same pharmacy and they pay more money, more money for 80 percent of the drugs on that formulary than the person walking in with no insurance. That is bizarre. That is wacky. The person with insurance paying more for drugs than the person with no insurance. That's a ripoff of the American taxpayer. It's a ripoff of, of the federal employees. And it's got to stop. It's got to stop. We can save billions of dollars. We can save billions, in my opinion, if we do this program correctly. And in this environment, with our current fiscal problems, we've got to look to every opportunity to save money. This is one. The current uh, pharmacy benefit manager model is, is so convoluted, it is structured to defend itself by the risk of, of being understood. It is so complex. It is beyond anything that, that, that anyone, look, I'm, a, I'm an attorney in two states. I, I'm not a stupid person. And I cannot for the life of me figure out what these drug companies are charging us and what they're, they're paying for, for pharmaceuticals. And I have, we have worked, this committee has worked a long time trying to figure this out. And this is a racket that has got to go away. Maybe years ago they didn't care about this stuff, but, but we got to start, we got to start paying attention here and uh, demanding, demanding that, that the taxpayer and the federal employees be treated, treated fairly. And, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is just wrong. This is wrong the way this system is being operated. They've been using the same excuses all along about why they can't tell us how much they, they uh, pay for these drugs so that we can make sure they're making a reasonable uh, profit on this. Uh, we hired the pharmacy benef benefit managers to negotiate on behalf of employees so they get us the best price. The problem is, some of these pharmacy benefit managers are owned by the drugstore. They're owned, and that's what this bill gets at. It stops the drugstore from owning the, the, the pharmacy benefit program. So this is, a, this is a good bill, and we're going to have a tough time over in the Senate because drug companies are going to come in and they're going to want to lobby those folks and turn their votes around. But this is a good bill, and it's reasonable, and I think it will protect the taxpayer and it will protect the federal employees. I yield back. Any other member wish to be heard on this? Uh, let's see. If no one of the members wish to speak, I now call up uh, H.R. 4489. The clerk will read the title of the bill. 
H.R. 4489 to amend Chapter 89 of Title V, United States Code, to ensure program integrity, transparency, and cost savings in the pricing and contracting of prescription drug benefits under the Federal Employee Benefit Health Benefits Program. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read without, excuse me, as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. I believe I have an amendment at the desk in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will designate the amendment, please. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 4489 offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I also ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as original text. And I recognize myself for five minutes to speak on the amendment. Uh, this amendment that I'm offering this morning represents some clarifications and changes that I felt were needed after receiving feedback from various stakeholders. The most significant change here uh, to H.R. 4489 is the reimbursement amount to pharmacy benefit managers found under the pricing section of the bill. Initially, the bill limited the reimbursements paid to pharmacy benefit managers to the average manufacturer price. Uh, that's what we felt was fair. Uh, we used the average manufacturer price in the original bill because it was one of only two pricing benchmarks that are based on actual acquisition costs. However, we did discover after review that there are some flaws with that pricing benchmark. One of the larger problems with using the average manufacturer's price is that the Office of Personnel Managers is, is excuse me, Office of Personnel Management is not equipped with the necessary resources to administer the contracts using that reimbursement method. So there's no way to track it. Also, using the average manufacturer price to reimburse the pharmacy benefit managers would mean that they would be in reimbursed less than what they paid for uh, the drug in most instances. So we don't want them to lose money. We just want a fair deal. And so we've made these adjustments so that the pharmacy benefit manager can continue to operate and, and make a, a fair profit. Uh, the amended bill uses no reimbursement benchmark or maximum allowed amount for prescription drugs purchased at retail. As stated in the original bill, the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program health plans will simply reimburse the pharmacy benefit managers the same amount that the benefit managers reimburse the retail pharmacy. They're already being paid, so there's no reason for any kickbacks to the uh, pharmacy benefit manager. Uh, for prescription drugs obtained through the mail order, uh, the health plans will reimburse the pharmacy benefit manager their actual acquisition costs plus a dispensing fee that ref reflects what they have paid. Uh, the bill requires that the dispensing fee not be any greater than the dispensing fee charged to the benefit the pharmacy benefit managers other lines of business. So we're asking for a fair, a fair deal here. And uh, under similar type contracts, uh, another notable change to the bill is that it now only is only applicable to experience rated carriers in the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan. Community rated carriers are exempt uh, from the bill's requirement because of how they determine the FEHBP rates. Uh, we also clarified the section uh, entitled Drug Substitution Requirements. We revised the title of that section to Restrictions on Brand Name Prescriptions uh, to clarify that these requirements do not apply to brand uh, to generic uh, drug sub, uh, excuse me, brand to generic uh, drug substitutions. Uh, in closing, and I know uh, Mr. Kucinich has to leave, so I'd like to get this vote in now. Uh, I'd like to clarify that these changes do not materially affect the substantial savings that will be generated by the passage of the bill. With that, I hope that all members will join me in supporting the amendment, and I now yield to the ranking member for five minutes for any comments he may have. Uh, I'll be very, very brief in that in saying, Mr. Chairman, very supportive of improvements to this bill. I still have underlying concerns with the overall bill, but I do believe and will be supportive of this amendment as I think it does improve it. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I, and I respect his reservations as well, and, and I, I hear him. Uh, if no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the Lynch Amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. I now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia report H.R. 4489 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on 
favorably reporting H.R. 4489 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to and H.R. 4489 is amended and ordered, reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Before moving to the next bill, I'd like to thank Jill Henderson, who has been on detail with my staff from OPM since I became chairman. Uh, Jill, unfortunately, will be leaving at the end of this week, and she will be sorely missed. Jill, you have done a wonderful job. One of the people who has uh, this pharmacy uh, bill, this uh, Federal Employee Health Benefit Program, is, again, one of the most complex things I have encountered. Uh, I, it's like learning another language. And uh, my translator, my interpreter uh, for this whole program is Jill, Jill Henderson. And we, we really appreciate it. She was detailed to this committee uh, from the Office of Personnel Management. Her, her work has been superb. Her energy and, and uh, patience, especially with me, has been uh, superhuman and uh, much appreciated. So uh, we all on this committee from both sides, uh, thank you for your service, and we sincerely wish you all the best. Uh, we now move to our final bill for the morning, which is H.R. 4865, the Federal Employees and Uniformed Service Retirement Equity Act of 2010. I'm glad that Congressman Chaffetz and I have jointly introduced this legislation to enhance workers' thrift savings plans. H.R. 4865 will allow federal and postal employees, as well, as well as members of the armed services, to deposit any unused or annual or vacation leave into their TSP accounts at retirement uh, or at deployment or in certain job transfer situations, such as uh, BRAC-related reassignment. That's base relocation and closings. In September 2009, the IRS allowed private sector employees to offer the same benefit to employees enrolled in 401k plans. However, a separate legislation under Title V is required to provide this flexibility to government, postal, and military personnel. This legislation simply provides these workers with another way to boost their uh, thrift saving plan accounts following a difficult economic period where many Americans experience plummeting 401k and TSP balances. I believe it's important that we act today to keep the thrift savings plan up to date in a way that is comparable to the private sector. And again, I thank the ranking member for his support on this measure, and I yield to the gentleman from Utah for any opening comments. I thank the chairman, and I, I thank you for uh, working so well together. This is something we're doing in a bipartisan way, which is just uh, simply good legislation and good public policy. And so I appreciate being able to co-sponsor this bill with you, which would allow federal employees and members of the uniformed services to deposit unused annual leave into the TSB at a retirement rate instead of taking a lump sum payment. This credit is currently received as a check or direct deposit into a bank account. It would be up to the employee to, whether to receive the lump sum payment or to roll it into his or her TSP. In September, the IRS issued a revenue ruling allowing employers with pension plans who provided a cash payment for unused sick leave or annual leave to give their workers the option of putting their money into their 401ks. This legislation is necessary to extend this benefit to the TSP. The deposit would be subject to the annual IRS limits or contributions, $16,500 for 2010, and this would not apply to unused sick leave. There would be no employer match since the federal government only provides lump sum payment for unused annual leave and unused sick leave does not qualify and is instead used for a retirement credit. The IRS allows deposits to be made at the retirement at the end of the year depending on, whether the employer, on, on when the employer provides the payment. Currently, the employee pays immediate tax on the lump sum payment. Under these provisions, while it would, would still be taxed, it would be tax deferred if the individual put it into the regular TSP. For those of us that are fiscally conservative, I, I am concerned that the uh, CBO would score this, but I want to remind all of my colleagues as this bill moves forward, this is a, a tax deferral. And anything we can do to encourage uh, employees who are, are moving on to uh, benefit their TSP will only benefit the country and them individually as we want to encourage uh, re retirement savings. And I think this is the spirit in which we move forward. Certainly it's based on what has happened recently with the IRS, 
Uh, but I think this is a common sense solution. It will benefit a lot of, number of employees. It will give them a choice to determine how they want to use their, their dollars. Uh, but I think it moves us in the right direction. And I, again, thank the Chairman for working together collaboratively on this and doing this in a bipartisan way. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to be heard on this? If no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 4865. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 4865 to amend Title V United States Code to provide that an employee of the Federal Government or member of the Uniformed Services may contribute to the Thrift Savings Fund any payment that the employee or member receives for accumulated and accrued annual leave or vacation leave and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. Are there any amendments? If there are if no member wishes to offer an amendment, I now move that the Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia report the bill, H.R. 4865, as introduced to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4865 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 4865, as introduced, is ordered reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. If there are no further remarks by the members, this concludes our business for the day. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make any technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered reported. Without objection, so ordered. The Committee now stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Thank, Thank you. you. Adam, how are we doing, buddy? All right, yourself, sir. Got the suit. Got the suit yeah. on. Like at noon. Coming over? Hmm? Coming over? Yeah. All right. You want to drive over or you want to? Um, Waiting yeah. out still? No. You guys go to the car.